Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So my friends from Geek and Sundry are building a guy bulk from Final Fantasy Realm Reborn in real life. So I wanted to do another bonus lore video that just talked a little bit about other legendary weapons in the game, as well as put it into perspective with the rest of the Final Fantasy series. So in the episode, they talk a little bit about why the guy bulk is so much cooler than, you know, 99% of all the other weapons. It's legendary. Anyone who's played WoW, or really any MMO for that matter, knows legendary items appear like once or twice on a server, with a few exceptions. There are craftable legendaries, you know, regular items that you just are able to add boss drops and other quest items to until you eventually craft it to legendary status. I think my WoW guild had to grind Firelands on Heroic for a month just to get our Boomkin his Dragon Wrath staff. The fun kind of wore off after the first few weeks, but look how shiny. In Realm Reborn, the Gaibolg is one of nine relic items that you obtain after an epic boss grind and a bunch of other quest completions. The start quest is actually called Relic Reborn and each relic is specific to each job, so here they are in no particular order. The Artemis Bow for the Bard, the Bravura for the Warrior, the Kurtana and Holy Shield for the Paladin, the Gaibolg for the Dragoon, of course, the Omnilex for the Scholar, the Sphari for the Monk, the Stardust Rod for the Black Mage, the Veil of Wii U for the Summoner, and the Thyrus for the White Mage. You could write an entire book for what it takes to obtain each of these weapons, but generally once you craft them, once you get that legendary, it is the best weapon in the game. Right now in Realm Reborn, you know, each of those relic items is the ultimate for each of those jobs. But there's always the promise of a new expansion and a new tier of items. In their new video, Nika actually talked to one of the GMs from Square Enix about the dragoons specifically, you know, just because they forged the guy bulk in real life. Dragoons are historically famous for fighting dragons, but they're featured in all of the Final Fantasy games, at least since Final Fantasy 2. Sometimes they're just mentioned in passing, or they're just a reference, or they're just used as a clothing item. Final Fantasy 4 on Super Nintendo was actually my introduction, my personal introduction to dragoons, and the series in general for that matter. In that game, Kane was the only dragoon, and he was more of a foil for you as the protagonist, but in each iteration of the game, the Gaibolg was their signature weapon. It looks like a pike or, you know, a polearm just because traditionally they fought dragons so you can't get in really close like you would with a sword. I totally applaud the creators of all the different Final Fantasy games for keeping the character traits consistent across 30 plus years of a game franchise. That's better continuity than the X-Men franchise right now. So Realm Reborn actually incorporates a lot of the lore and backstory for the dragoons that's built up since that second Final Fantasy game. So if you have played different versions of the game, you know, a lot of the character traits as well as items will look very familiar. This current version of the game also pays a lot of homage to the lore of the Dragoon characters you encounter. Most of them have the surname Highwind just because across the franchise that all the Dragoons flow from Kane Highwind and his family. They built a lot of that lore into the original, you know, Final Fantasy 2 game when they introduced the character. You know, so JRPGs aren't just cool now, they've always been that cool. That's why you see a lot of story teams created when big western games like Halo or other, you know, modern Western RPGs are in development. People in America learned from Japanese game makers how important story and lore was and started to integrate it into new games. That's why the best games always have the best stories. So if you look at the guy bulk, the Geek and Sundry built, you know, when Nika stands right next to it, yeah, she's not a giant, but that actually is a one-to-one -one scale. That's what it would be like in real life. So if you were using a polearm on Game of Thrones or any other medieval series, it would be that same size. They got a person to test it out. He's actually part of the Armored Combat League. They're like a sports league that LARPs and uses real life armor and weapons to do tourney sports. So all the stuff you see them wearing and using is stuff you would see on like a medieval battlefield. They got to stab a lot of stuff and even tried to replicate that Dragoon jump attack. You have to remember though that real life physics kind of sucks just because you're carrying like an extra 100 pounds of weight. So it would be like strapping cinder blocks under your feet and trying to slam dunk a basketball. If you can do that, you are probably making millions of dollars in the NBA right now. In general though, my other favorite class to play in Final Fantasy games is Black Mage. You know, yes, they're super cool to watch, but from a practical standpoint, if you can learn to deal with being a squishy cloth wear, you get way more powerful attacks. So you're one of the best DPS classes. Unless you're fighting someone with high magic resist. Yeah, then you're just squishy. But I feel like magic DPS is way more useful later in the game, or especially if you're trying to solo level. The issue you run into with MMOs in general is class tuning. So as you start maxing out your gear, all the classes start to become equally useful in raid. So I also actually wanted to include a little update on Final Fantasy XV. That's like the next numbered sequel in the series, although not all of them are direct sequels to the games that came before them. 
So the most recent Final Fantasy game they've released is Lightning Returns, and yes, it's pretty cool, but Final Fantasy XV has actually been in development since 2006, or before 2006. They actually showed footage of it at E3 in 2006. The reason it takes so long to release a new numbered sequel in the franchise is because they basically change everything about the game so much with each new iteration. And remember, the footage we have is from 2006, and think about how much games have changed just in the way they look from 2006 to now, so they've actually had to redesign the game several times along the way. There isn't an official release date other than what they've said, you know, 2015, you know, with fingers crossed. In keeping with recent tradition, the game actually jumps to a much different time period, you know, much more modern this time. Like the differences between Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX, you know, one is super techy and the other is super steampunky. The last official update we got from Square Enix was in February, and they said the game was, you know, very far along in development, which is kind of vague, but I'm expecting, you know, November, December of 2015, unless we get to E3 next year and they have nothing, in which case it's probably going to be forever. Games take way longer to make than movies, so don't be surprised if it takes longer to finish. So in related news, I'm actually going to be doing a couple more bonus lore videos over the next couple of weeks. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. Feel free to leave me suggestions for other games if you really want me to do like a lore or a weapon video for one of those. But I'm also eventually going to probably move these videos to my gaming channel later this summer. So you'll see them on Charlie's streams. So I'll just keep doing them. So right now, click here to watch Geek and Sedry make that guy bulk in real life. It's actually really, really cool. And click here to get my Elder Scrolls lore video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.